endorphin. Monitoring. 
and one is sugar. If I have high sugar in my bloodstream, what does it pull into my bloodstream? Water. So I'm pulling the water from my brain tissue into my bloodstream. A contusion is a bruise of the brain and a concussion. Does a concussion, can I see a concussion on an MRI or CT? Not necessarily, no. Which hematoma is considered an emergency? Epidural. Because that's the one where you lose consciousness and then you wake up completely fine. Completely lose it. And then it grows really fast and my brain can't compensate. Hold the eyes open. 
open, move the head quickly from side to side. There should be no movement of the eyes if the patient is brain dead. Should also be tested vertically. Taking care not to extubate the patient with this maneuver. And there's no responsiveness to that either. Next, we'll check the hocalorics, or the octal-vestibular reflex. We put the head of the bed up to 30 degrees, which is at approximately right now, to get the proper orientation of the semicircular canals. You look in the ear to make sure that the external auditory canal is free of blood or cerumen or anything else that might be blocking it, and make sure that the tympanic membrane is intact, which it is. Obviously, you check both ears, which I won't do. You put a chucks or some kind of absorbent material next to the patient's head, and you have someone help to hold open the eyes. And we hold the eyes open and look for a movement for at least 60 seconds. There should be no movement with insulation of the ice water.
extreme sports, high speed driving, if you're a senior, let me know. Male gender, sorry guys, number age, alcohol and illicit drug use, any type of act of violence, if you have arthritis in your spine, falls, there we go, and there, and that is at cancer. So, let's say you're at the scene, and you, it's a car accident, what do you do? Right, you're in your scrubs, so you have to respond to it until the emergency services get there. Always assume there's a spinal cord injury. So we want to immobilize the head and neck by putting our thumbs right across the mandible and the rest of our fingers on the neck. Because essentially what you're doing is you're holding that neck and head in place and you're log rolling to get them on the backboard and then you're holding it in place while we're getting the seat spine on. We don't even want them going like this, going like this. We don't want that head to move at all. No twisting movements. Is anybody here in EMT or paramedic or working like an emergency room and has experienced this stuff? How often do you see injuries because somebody didn't do this properly? Have you ever seen it? Yeah. So that's why sometimes it some they'll um, I believe what is it? I don't know. But um, if somebody is safe in the car, like there's no immediate danger to the person, don't touch them. Just maybe sit behind them, put your hands on them. Because my biggest thing is if I'm not trained to move them, I don't want to unless I absolutely have to, right? And you're still holding on to them while we're putting the seat collar on. And the seat collar stays on until they get ruled out for a spinal cord injury. I've had many patients that got admitted to a med surge unit with their seat collar on until the radiologist read the actual CT scan. So, pathophysiology of a spinal cord injury. So, it can be anything from a concussion, lesion, compression of the tissue, or complete separating of the spinal cord. It's most common from C5, C5 to C7. T12 or L1. Um, if I have a spinal cord injury in my cervical region, I get something quadriplegia, which is what? All my extremities. Thoracic um, injuries and lower paraplegia, which is? Um, where the injury occurs, my level of injury. Right? If I have a spinal cord injury at T9, from T9 down, I have injury. If I have a cervical in injury at C1, my whole spinal cord's gone. Again, primary versus secondary injury. Primary is from the actual trauma, secondary is what comes afterwards, like a hematoma or a swelling. Most of the patients that have spinal cord injuries are veterans. And any injury above C4, you're probably going to need a medical care. So, you guys remember the anterior, posterior, sensory motor, right? The anterior is what? Motor. Motor. Posterior is? Sensitive. Sensitive posterior alone, right? Okay. So, central. You have motor deficits and sensory loss. Why? Because you might be sitting there like, well, what's the difference between this one and this one, right? They're in the almost the same spot. But if you look closely, this stops just in the anterior portion. This one extends into the sensory portion. It's extending forward to the posterior. That's why it's called central. And that's why there's some sensory and motor loss. And central, bowel bladder dysfunction is variable. Depends on what level it's at, how bad the um, injury is. Usually this one occurs when I have a cervical injury or a hyperextension injury. I'm gonna go over to anterior next. So again, anterior is really just in that anterior motor pathway, right? So I have a loss of motor, pain, temperature sensation, but I can still feel some vibration and touch, right? Because I'm not really getting into that sensory part. Um, this is when I get these type of injuries with just disc herniations or hyperflexion or any type of fracture or dislocation of the vertebrae itself. And this one is lateral. It's also called Brown Sinclair syndrome, or I laughed at when I first read. So this one is where we have paralysis on one side of the body with loss of touch. 
remember, motor, sensory. This is one side of the body, this is the other. Does that make sense? Now, on your exam, I'm not going to ask you questions about C5, what are you expecting? This isn't your study guide that I made for you guys. Will your NCLEX? Oh, yeah. Will ATI? Probably.
that that's all they need to relieve their um, spinal cord symptoms. So, I'm sure you guys have seen spinal fusion in people's charts. It's very commonly performed when the spine is not stable. It's a big fancy term for saying that I'm taking a disc out and I'm fusing those two vertebrae together. Just to stabilize the spine, but in my opinion, again, it's just an opinion, I feel like it causes a lot of pain when you're on top of If I'm doing a cervical one, I can do it at the front of the neck. If I'm doing thoracic or lumbar, I'm going to be on my belly. And I'm going to go through my back. I can take donor bone from the iliac crest to fuse it together. Maintain your life. After this, you want to do neurological and vital signs frequently, right? Because they're playing around with your spinal cord. And then education. There will always be an area of decreased motion. Because you don't have that disc anymore that's going to allow as much movement within the spine. I can't bend by performing that. Neurogenic shock. This is a very common complication within 24 hours of spinal trauma. Sudden loss of communication between the sympathetic nervous system. And usually our sympathetic nervous system maintains our muscle tone in our blood vessels. So I don't have that anymore. My vessels are just open, right? They're thinking that they can take a vacation. And what that does is my blood is kind of pools in my veins. And if it's in my veins, what is it not getting back to? It's not getting back to my heart, right? So if I'm not getting blood back to my heart, I can't pump it out, right? So CO stands for cardiac output. So that output from my heart goes down. So I'm not what? another term for perfusion. I'm not perfusing. So, and my heart rate's also going to go down because my heart doesn't think it needs to pump as hard because it doesn't have as much stuff to pump around, right? So, the mean arterial pressure, which has to do with your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, you guys are going to that for, yeah? But we have a certain level we need to maintain because your map tells you how well your heart's perfusing to the rest of your body. So I want to keep that up. I want to keep my cardiac output up. I need to keep them proper positioning. Because this is the type of patient you want laying flat. Why do I want to monitor for DVTs and DVs? Because it's stagnant, yes. And then monitoring for any type of bowel or bladder dysfunction. Why it's an issue later on, but um, I've had some patients that they stick strictly to 
up your insurance issue, right? Maybe your insurance won't cover it because they can say, well, I'd rather cover your intermittent calf kits than cover your surgery, right? Yes. So for these patients, there'd be a constant I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You first speak, you gotta say, all right. For these patients' bladders tend to learn how to hold you more. Yeah, because, so, I'm gonna get personal for a second. I could go a very long time without pain. I worked in a daycare center for a long time, and if you're working with kids, you know that it can't just be moving to the bathroom when you want. And then being a nurse working 12, 14 hour shifts, you just learn to hold it, right? I could go virtually the entire day without going to the bathroom. My body is trained to stretch. So my body probably doesn't have to be able to look out like a leader. But I have a friend who literally pees every hour. Her body tells her to go to the bathroom probably when she's got like two. So you're correct. In flaccid, their bladders learn to hold a lot more. I've had somebody that one time, I don't remember how much, why I decided to put a catheter in him. But he had a plastic neurogenic bladder. And he was like, no, it's too early, too early, too early. I think I kind of like palpated and I felt his bladder. I ended up getting a liter and a half out of him when I put the catheter in. He had no idea. He was like, no, it's too early. I think he was not fluid too. He Anyway, so now you can also have a neurogen bowel. It's similar whether it's upper or lower motor neurons. There's no spastic or flaccid, but these are the patients that are gonna have mainly stool softeners or bulk forming or both. And these are also the ones that are gonna need to, need to do digital stimulation to keep up. And you gotta be careful that you don't stimulate your vagal nerve. Lovely. And most of the time, so, I've had somebody who's had this before, and he knew it every, it was like every day at 8 p.m. He got on his commode, and he did the drill simulation, and he went to the bathroom. That's just, that was his daily routine. And I'm sure your next question is, did he wear a glove? The answer is no. But I mean, it's his own. You just wash your hands after Keep your room warm, maybe the room is cold. 
anything you want to take off. Access for anything I'm in your family fund and your What's the first thing you do?
so then you learn muscle relaxant for spasticity. And when, when, when are my muscles spastic?
Um, increased physical activity, excessive stress, hyperventilation, because if I'm breathing, so okay, so we're going to get a little bit of breath When I breathe out, what do I breathe out? CO2. When I breathe in, I'm bringing oxygen. So if I'm hyperventilating, what am I breathing out too much of? CO2. And CO2 does what in my brain? If I have too much of it, Less 
15 seconds of a brief loss of awareness. You're staring blankly, you're very still, maybe your eyelids are fluttering a little bit, and you just kind of suddenly stop what you're doing. You just suddenly start zoning out. And then you just suddenly then return back to the activity that you're doing when the seizure started. It's like your brain is buffering. So a lot of these, some of these can be completely missed. Absolutely. So I will say, I was actually at the chiropractor when my niece was having her absence seizure. And my sister-in-law was describing it to me through text. And I was like, sounds like she's just tired. I'll see her when I get home. But I live. And she was explaining it to me when I got home and I saw my niece. And I was like, that looks weird. And I pulled up a video of an absence seizure and I showed her, my sister-in-law, without showing her what it was, she said that's exactly what she was doing. So if I wasn't there, and somebody's not like medically trained, they might not catch an absence seizure. I will say too, working in a daycare, I saw one kiddo that was having a lot of these, and they thought she just had ADHD. Because little girls, their symptom of ADHD is inattentiveness and like staring off into space. But it turns out she's actually having absence seizures. And I think it was a teacher that caught it. Now, part of the photo looks like, oh yes. Will the seizure show up on MRI if somebody's having an active It'll show up on seizure. It'll show up on an EEG. Okay. It won't show up on the MRI, yeah. but it'll show up on the EEG. Because seizures, no matter the type, have to do with your brainwave abnormalities. So that's when somebody will have an EEG for a 24 hour period to try and capture those little moments of an absence seizure. I believe absence seizures have to do, don't quote me on this, have to do with the delta waves and they slow down. Complex partial seizure. So this is behavior that the patient is unaware of, like lip snapping. Loss of consciousness or blackout for several minutes. And then immediately, they have an amnesia immediately before and after. Simple partial. I maintain my consciousness. It is really just unusual sensations like being out low, Jason in your heart rate or flushing, unilateral abnormality of extremity movement, pain, and offensive smell. Now, every time you have deja vu, don't think you're having a seizure like me, right? I do the same thing. But these people will have senses of deja vu like multiple times a day, in a day. You know what I mean? And then they won't have it for weeks. In your notes section, I'm not going to show it here because I just don't want to take too much time. I found a video, it's a very random YouTube video, but it shows most of these what they look like, and I thought it was very helpful to them all. Testing. So a color drug screening, HIV, toxins, electrolyte agencies, looking for what could possibly be the reason for the seizure is a video pattern. And then EEG, MRI, CT, or a lumbar puncture for CSF analysis. But when can I not do a lumbar puncture?
how long it lasted. Because the longer the seizure, what do you think happened to my brain? Nothing to that tissue. Yeah, it's just constantly getting attacked, right? And if I'm constantly getting attacked and I'm not getting oxygen through it, what's going to happen to my tissue? Because sometimes if it's only lasting like 30 seconds to a minute, wait till the seizure's done. But if it's lasting longer than a minute, maybe we need to intervene with medication, right? And then after the seizure, we're going to keep them sidelined, monitor vital signs and any of injury, with neuro checks, we're going to reorient the patient, allow them to rest. Keep them calm, keep the room calm. Like if you have a family in there and they're freaking out with their seizure, maybe you would say, I'm gonna go outside and go take a breath, right? Determine if the patient experienced any war up so we know what is gonna happen the next time, and then we wanna try and determine the trigger. Oh, yes. Is it possible that even if the person is, you know, not hitting their head on anything, they can get a contusion or a concussion from the seizure is from the brain should be. Yep. Because at that point, when you think about it, your brain's just like, what the heck is happening? And it's just constantly firing neurons to try and figure out what happened. And when I have way too much firing action going on, that's a seizure. Okay. So we're monitoring for those. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And after a head injury, like right, that increased ICP, right? And I see increased ICP can also lead to seizure. And what is something you need to have in your room at all times if you have a patient with a disease? Suction, oxygen, and what else? What do you put on the bed? Yes. So I had a patient that was in the hospital. Yeah. Thank you. 
stroke, but it would be uh, uh, intracranial, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And there's varying degrees of that. I do believe we're going to get to that when we talk about hemorrhagic stroke. It's a classification of hemorrhagic stroke, but if you didn't have stroke like symptoms, they're not going to call it one. So they would just call it minor intracerebral. Because sometimes, I mean, people have small brain bleeds, and sometimes they don't have any symptoms at all. But he was also on the wrong medication for high blood pressure. <laughs> so I wonder if that was a part of the pressure that probably caused the blood vessels to burn. How did they get up here? How did they catch you on the wrong uh, blood pressure medication? Um, it was actually a blood pressure medication, but um, it was 25 milligrams, but it wasn't healthy in the pressure, so his pressure was going up over 100 and That's why med breaks are so important too, because I've seen a lot of times where people have high blood pressure just because two medications are contraindicated together, and it's decreasing the effectiveness of the antihypertensive. I've seen a lot where they just never went back to their doctor, or the doctor didn't think about that, and forgot they were on that medication, maybe their blood list is like 30 long, and they repeat that when it's human, and they just don't think to increase the dosage. Fun fact, which one do you do? There is a test called Gene Sight. I don't know if it's specific just to sight meds or if it's all meds in general, yeah. but it's a cheek swab and it actually tells you how you metabolize certain medications. So we use all. It's all. I'm pretty sure it's all. It's all? Because wow. it's something you allergic to, like if you can't, like, that doesn't metabolize. But what would be more effective than others? Like, yeah. It would be like the cultured sensitivity kind of testing, which one's more. Yeah, it's exactly like the cultured sensitivity. Office a lot. It's actually how we learned we kept increasing this one kiddo's dose of Zoloft. And then she did the gene site, and it was actually that she needed a very small dose to wait for her body to metabolize the drug. And once we did that, she had a marked improvement of her symptoms. Let's say, for whatever reason, they're having a breakthrough seizure. A patient can take a magnet, put her <coughs> in 
very hypotensive, copy that. Do not use it in pregnancy. Most 
So my lungs and my respiratory system is trying to compensate for this. But then my lungs can only work so hard, right? So then I'm going to go to uh, respiratory arrest. What can cause sad pathologies? Rapid withdrawal of baby needs. So they don't fulfill their medication, they just stop it immediately. <laughs> and in readers, you will cerebral edema. Infection of fever or infected metabolic disturbances. Nursing actions. If this is happening, you need to maintain that airway, airway provided to establish IV access to be monitoring. Airway, breathing, circulation. I want to know what their glucose is, what their stable electrolytes are. Maybe it's a potassium balance, maybe it's a uh, one type of glycemic. I don't know why, why I don't know what this work is supposed to be. But diastin or lorazepam lo first, so it probably goes. I can push, and then I get my refilling point. The goal is to stop this seizure immediately. And this is this is the case. And if I'm giving a few doses of IV benzos to try to stop the seizure, and it's not working, I'm going to put them in that to try to stop that assault on my girl. So this is the one where if I can't stop the seizure or the seizure or correct, but the IV benzos, even if I start the IV penny joint and it's not working, I'm putting them in a bed of being coma. I need to lessen that brain activity myself. Please sedate. Because 